looking at um, being more specific in terms of square feet per station. And we've divided the um, departments into different space intensive types of, of um, categories. So category A has a typical multiplier of 150 square feet per station. That's mostly for engineering types of programs. Category B has 100 square feet per station. That's for some of the larger types of uh, departments and so on. And then, so these are, are separated out by zip code. Um, category C is 75, and that is your typical biology, chemistry, food science, architecture, and so on. Category D is, is again, more generalized, and category C is more office-related type stuff. So here's the way that works. Again, we separate out lower division from upper division. Again, everything in pink is a fixed number that comes from those categories, that, that chart that I showed you before. And all you're looking for is the information coming from the registrar on numbers of sections for the disciplines in A, B, C, D, or E, and F, the weekly lab hours in those categories, and the total enrollments. So again, I, I just sort of made up an institution, and I said that in category C, and let's go back, category C would be general science related things, um, cell biology, civil engineering, interior design, pharmacy, organic chemistry, and so on, nursing. So in category C, there were 48 sections. It had um, 101 weekly lab hours for total enrollment of 1,040 students. And again, you would fill in all those blue categories. And then once you do just those, that, those, those three numbers in each of these categories, it works by itself. So section size, uh, if we were to take the total enrollment of 1,040 and divide it by the number of sections, 48, we would have the average section size of 22. At 80% seat utilization, that 22 becomes a lab of 28. Looking up in the chart automatically, it says that a, a category C laboratory would require 75 square feet per student station. 28 times 75 is 2,100 square feet per lab. The number of labs would be 20 hours divided into the 101 on the blue box, which says you need five of these labs times the 2,100 means that you need 10,000 square feet of lab space. Uh, the 30% of, of support space for prep rooms, for instrumentation, and so on, uh, is comes again from the stand, from the, that chart above, uh, which means you need 4,500 square feet of that, and so the total is that number. And again, you look at all of the different um, disciplines and apply the blue box um, information that, that's necessary, and it runs automatically based upon these guidelines. It's different for upper division and grad students. Uh, again, the station utilization is 75% instead of the 80%. The um, hours per week per room is 15 instead of the 20. And the numbers just go through it just the way you did for the, under, for the lower division. Part three, let me, and, and anytime you want to stop and ask a question, go ahead and do it because you know, I'm just going to keep going through this and, unless you stop me. Um, there is uh, on campus a category called open laboratory. These are typically lab spaces like computer labs, writing labs, uh, language labs, art studios, music practice rooms, informal student collaboration spaces. So on Tuesday, we talked about how to, to categorize the FICOM number for student collaboration spaces, whether they are a 400 number, 410 or 420 number from study space, or whether they belong in the open lab and studio space. For square feet purposes, I think you will get more out of it if it stays in this category where it's been categorized um, in the guidelines. Um, but essentially, uh, you take the enrollment number, which you've already 
in, uh, input in, in early on in this uh, on the spreadsheet, it times oops, times five and it comes up with 62,000 square feet of space for all these different categories of space space types. And you divide it up however uh, you need to do that. Research laboratories are, are more difficult to model and we're giving two different ways to do it. And you choose the one that gives you more space. Um, one way is to do it on a dollars research dollars uh, expenditure. And the other way is to do it on the number of researchers and the number of people who are involved in research. So the first way we're going to look at it is research expenditures. And essentially what you're looking for is uh, research expenditures average over a three year period, the last three years. Uh, and you break it down into highly space intensive research, space intensive or moderately space intensive. And I'll go back through the chart and I'll show you that in a moment. And a further breakdown is the on-campus research and off-campus research. Um, so the the categories uh, again are SIP code related. Into those that require more space are highly space intensive category A, space intensive uh, category B, moderately space intensive, and office space. And these each have a square foot uh, impact to it. So the way in which this works for looking at research expenditures, we'll look at personnel in a moment, but, but doing it on a research basis is, um, and again, I made this up for a make-believe university. So supposing in discipline category B, there were $9.6 million worth of, on average of, of research expended, um, and they only do on campus, they didn't do off campus. Um, and $1.2 million worth of research on category C and $800,000 in category D, which is basically office related research. The um, guidelines calls for a net assignable square feet per million dollars, depending upon the category uh, of space intensive. Um, and What's interesting is that that, that that was based on the 212 time period. And so because of inflation, that should change every year. So from 2012 to now, it's about 11% difference. So a million dollars today would buy less square feet today than it would in 2012. So this is adjusted for inflation. So if you had $9.6 million worth of uh, research in 2012, you, in, in 2012, you'd use this multiplier of 5,000 square feet per, um, per million, but um, changing it, adjusting it for, for inflation, you'd actually be able to use every million dollars would buy $4.6 million, 4.6, 4, 4,670 square feet of space, so um, per million. So basically, 9.6 times times 4,670 4, square feet means that you need 4,400, 44,000 square feet of, of research, um, and 1.2 million dollars worth of research would require. Um, as an adjustment, 1.2 times 3,100, you need 3,700 square feet of research, totaling 48,000 square feet of, of research. Um, and again, the um, office related research, 0.8 times 2310 requires 1,800 square feet of research. So a total of, of 48,5 and 18,5 for this way of developing the amount of research space by a dollar amount. Another way to do it is by personnel, which I, th which I think, uh, if I remember looking at, at um, how the models have been used, it, almost always you use this, this way. It might be simpler to gather the information. Um, but we're looking for 
all those folks that are engaged in research. And so we're looking for FT numbers of faculty, PhD, postdocs, not, you know, non-faculty related po people doing research, graduate students, undergraduate students, visitors, adjuncts. All of these people are generating space in research to the extent that they are. Uh, and again, we're looking for the FTE quantity is, is entered into the blue cells by personnel category and by discipline group. And the FTE is defined by load or by contract. Again, the disciplines by SIP code. Um, and the way in which, you know, it's space intensive or highly space intensive and so on. Uh, and these are the, the different square foot multipliers that would be used for each of these categories of people that are involved with research. So um, these are the, the guidelines that are fixed in place and the number of people would be uh, defined on the left-hand side. So looking here, um, that's come, that comes from the guidelines that so that doesn't change. What we're looking for are those things in blue that, that do change and that you input. So I'm just looking at, again, a make-believe institution that had um, X number of faculty involved with research. So, um, but we're looking for every one of those types of people involved with research to the extent that you can define them. Uh, and then we're looking across this way. So 14.2 category A faculty members times 600 square feet plus 122 category B faculty members times 450 plus 68 category C faculty times 300 plus 77 faculty times 50 gives you a number 87,895,000 square feet of research space. Um, lab support space is generated by a percentage that is applied to each of those categories. And in the end, you get a total of 131,000 square feet of research space just based upon the faculty numbers here. So obviously that number will be different when you use your real numbers, but also it will be different because we're filling in each of those different categories of PhD and postdoc and the non-faculty researchers that are involved, the GRAs, GTAs, and so on. So that's the way this one works. And I think this is used most frequently or more frequently than the uh, expense uh, way to do it. So part five is looking at office type of uh, categories. And here we're counting only staff requiring office space. We're not counting people who are in the auxiliary category. We're, we're really looking for E and G type of, of folks only. Uh, we're looking for FTE categories. Uh, we use headcount in a couple of categories, mostly related to students. Um, but the employee data should correspond to the point in time used for other um, submissions to THEAD. Um, for student employees, the number should represent the typical peak and not the total number. Uh, it's not the cumulative total over the course of a year, but, but it would be a peak time number. So here we have, again, uh, a chart that you fill in in the blue boxes, and it works by itself once you do the number. So you put in the total FTE in blue here, the number of deans, the number of associate deans, department chairs, and so on all the way down to uh, students and so on. These are the multipliers in pink. It fills in automatically things in white and it totals it up. It gives, the, the, so in addition to the total number of office related uh, needs up generated by people there, and that's subtotal, there's the 30% of that is also for work rooms and conference rooms and support spaces and so on. And then you get the total overall. So it's important to be able to identify the hundreds of different categories that you have into these um, generalized categories. Um, and, you know, um, I don't think there is a crosswalk for all the different categories of, of personnel that each university has. So it's up to you, I think, to think about how to, to distribute your folks into these categories. Some of them are more easily defined than others. 
you only have one president or one chancellor, uh, but you have X number of deans, you have X number of vice presidents and so on. So study library. Um, for this category, the guidelines break it out into numbers of readers, the amount of volumes in a library, and then the, the, the staffing for the library. And it starts with looking at the existing volumes or volume equivalents that you have in your library. Um, it looks at whether or not you have volumes in compact shelving and cartographic collection. The student enrollments come from what you've already put in place in the first blue boxes that you filled in, in at the beginning of, of the, uh, the spreadsheet. Um, and then it says that we're looking for the number of, of tables and carols and groups that would be required in the library, given the percentage of people in the different categories of, 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 um, of space. So those folks who are living on campus, you want to provide at least seating for 25% of those numbers of students. For the on-ground, off-campus environment, um, those folks, you, present, you, you, you look at for... 5% of those need to be seated at any one time. And online is also 5% because sometimes they are on campus online. And so that totals the number of tables and carols and, and groups of folks that you need to have based upon your enrollments and the way in which you're looking at those enrollments. Down below, we're saying that there's a different set of multipliers for the different types of tables and chairs and groups that you might have so if this number is any number, that number, let's say it's 1,500, will be distributed by these different groups of seating. 45% would be standard seating. 25% would be groups and enhanced with electronics and so on. 20% might be reserved and assigned, and 10% are group study. So that 1,500 would be distributed by those percentages and come up with that same number, but distributed by the by these percentages times these multipliers, that actually should be pink. And then you come up with the square feet number um, in that category. Then you're looking at the volumes that might be in the library. And there's a sliding square feet per volume, depending upon the number of volumes. So for the first 1500 volumes, it's, it's a 10th of a square foot per volume and then it decreases as the number of volumes increase. And there's a different multiplier for compact shelving and cartographic collection and so on. But, but once you put in the number of volumes, it actually then goes right through again automatically and fills in these numbers. It comes up with the square feet. And so what we have then is the total number of square feet for, for the reader stations the total amount of square feet for all the volumes that you might have in the collection by size of collection. And then the formula looks at, uh, if you add those two numbers up and take 12% of that, that's how much you need for tech services and for the professional staff who are working there and so on. And then you come up with the total number for this category of study and library. Now, here's another thing that you might, that THEC might want to look at again as the libraries have changed dramatically over the last decade or so, where they're putting fewer books out and moving books into um, off-site storage or on-site storage, but out of the library to make room for more student groups and more collaborative types of spaces. That might have a, 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 an impact on how you think about this guideline. But for now, these are the guidelines that are in place and it would generate a good square footage of space for a typical library. But essentially we're taking the totals from, from the seating and the totals from the library and adding those together, taking 12 and a half percent of that and coming up with the total. And the last part is part seven, physical education. Here, it, is, it assumes that for a certain size institution, you need at least 40,000 square feet of space for, 
for physical ed plus 11 square feet per, per, per FTE student. Or for a larger university, you need a, a minimum of 68,000 square feet plus 11 square feet per student, and you come up with the total. So again, this is this is for the category defined as physical education. It's not for athletics. It's not for recreation. It is for the PE component. And that's a real sort of quick push through how the model, how the standards work. To me, the most difficult ones that, that we hear about are the ones that deal with the classroom because of the way in which it's looking for data that is should be easily defined by the registrar, but apparently is, is, is not carefully defined as, as in, in those categories. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to open it up for any questions. And there are folks who use these, the, 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 these guidelines frequently and might have some comments. Bear in mind that these standards that are here are system-wide standards and they're not meant to be a guideline that you would use to do a building, not meant to be used as a way to think about a renovation of, a, of an exit of a building. It is meant to be looking at overall university wide needs. Uh, and there are different standards and so on that you might want to apply when you're looking at a specific building, other than these that, that are, are tied to a system wide look at that needs of the whole university. I'll stop. Thank you, Art. You're welcome. Just a, a side note while everyone is thinking about that question for the, the uh, large scale use of these, these formula uh, formulas as it applies to the different types of spaces. You can approach this as a beginning measure. We talked about this yesterday with Art uh, for these figures for classrooms and labs and so on. It's a starting point. Uh, as you all know, as you program and you get everybody in the room and ask everybody what they need, uh, it can grow uh, very quickly. Uh, but you can use this as a starting point to understand what those differences are for programming. Although as Art says, it really will not serve uh, as a program per se for any particular project. Art, would you like to elaborate on that? Well, you know, it, it gets back to the, the changes that have happened in pedagogy that, that are forcing um, changes in multipliers. So for instance, you know, active learning environments are really require more space per seat than, than um, any guideline would have thought about even five or, or, or 10 years ago. So I, I think that, that there needs to be some flexibility uh, when you're looking at, at particular projects to be able to, to start with these standards, but then say that, or, 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 or be able to justify why it needs to be something else uh, as, you, as you move forward in trying to define your program. Hey, Art, this is, this is Dick. I think that, again, this is, and you understand, the challenge we continue to have is how to apply the standards to the TCATs. Yep. And we've, tr we've tried, and it, it continues to be a huge issue in designing new facilities, programming new facilities. The designers are saying they don't work. Yep. You know, I mean, and so, I mean, and they look at the, I give them the information, you know, kind of go through this. They look at the formula and they, and architects say we don't know how to we, we can't line it up i mean we'll, you know, i mean what do we do to line that up yeah uh, you know and and i didn't talk about the tcats because i, I think that that there's enough question about whether or not uh, a, a different way to look at tcats should be actually put in place so um and i and i know that there were some difficulties uh, that that were um found very early on. So I, I, I think that that's a good area for a review of whether or not there needs to be a different methodology for TCADs than uh, are shown in, in the guidelines here. I, I think that the guidelines for the TCADs generate actually more space than, than 
um, the reality would be. There, there was a new, uh, a new formula, Dick, as you know, for, for all the TCATs out of the uh, first TCAT master plan. It doesn't look like this at all. It's based on the individual program. Yeah, and but taking that and trying to get the, that and some of that worked and some of that didn't work. But again, what we're given, what we're having to give the designers is they're the when we're looking at the TCATs, we're looking at proposing capital outlay projects is we're telling them they have to follow the THEC standard, right? The THEC guidelines. And, and it, which is the it, it basically this information, and so we're trying to kind of piece that together. I think some of that some of that worked as we as we completed the master plan. Some of that didn't work so well. What what part of the master plan didn't work? Do you know, I'm trying to take those square footages. I think we looked at there was ranges of square footages um, based off of different. But the, it got into, I think they, they talked about how a course was taught. And if I taught it one way, the, the square foot need may be less. If you taught it a different way, it may be more. The problem was, is when that guy left, we got a new guy in and said, well, that's not the way I teach the class. I teach it this way. So it wasn't, a, it was kind of a, it was, it was more to make it work for what we had. You know, it's kind of back into some of those numbers and, and really project forward. Yeah, and I think Art's comment earlier is that that even for the TCATs and their individual program square footages, that was generally to establish whether or not overall the a TCAT was within range and probably is not a real good guide for the program. So what we're looking for is when we give them the charts and it talks about all the rooms that you went through, where did TCAT programs fit in those? You know, you talk about research, you talk about physical education, you looked at, you know, labs, science labs and all that. Where do they're, they're looking for where the, those programs fit in a chart somewhere? You know, that, where, they none of that really applies in TCATs, Dick. I got it. That they're looking, but that's what they're looking for. What's the standard for that? Yeah, this probably the THEC guidelines, like Art said, is is an overall look and is probably not a good basic matrix for individual building design. Why is the TCAT looking for research? No, I'm saying they're looking at the charts we're giving them, like these things. They're, we're giving that to the designers, and they're saying, okay, where does automotive fit in? Nursing, we can kind of make that work, but a lot of the other programs, mechatronics, how do they figure out class size, lab size, those types of things? And then once you, once that you put really that, it backs into the other information. So we're so the art so we're so we're crafting what we can trying to take the information but again this is campuses are trying to put together um their, their capital outlay projects and want to do some initial programming so we're hiring consultants but we don't know they're saying well what do we use, what do we work off of uh, and then when you run the numbers and you compare them against, if you run TCAT numbers and you run them compared against community college numbers for usage square footage, they're, they can be way out of whack. And say, so, well, it looks like you got more square footage than you need when you compare it on some of the, uh, the metrics. Yeah, the TCAT numbers generally are significantly higher than the community college. Yeah, square footage, but but they're but they're the programs are maxed out. So the square footage shows they don't need any more space. You can't get, you can't add another car in there to, to teach, you know, 10 more students. I'm not sure. This is Patty. I'm oh, go ahead, Art. I was gonna say, uh, I'm not sure what the issue uh, is uh, because there were some specific, I thought, um, standards or guidelines to use just for the TCATs that didn't include the research category, didn't include that. So I'm not sure what they were looking at. Um, 
where they they're they're trying to develop a program. You know what I mean? Like there there was a a specific uh, set of of charts that were geared only for the for the TCATs. Yeah, like the, what that's what Carl was talking about. We backed into that with with Woody uh, uh, when we did the master plan. I mean, that was something that we we had to come up with to kind of make you know, when we were doing the master plan. It, it wasn't based off of it was just based off of what we had. I mean, it wasn't based off of what other other institutions doing, what other systems doing. It was just based off of information that we had. Working with him, looking at what we had, talking with we had Jeff Holmes working on it. it. There wasn't any scientific way to do it. It was just saying, okay, if we look at this and his is different than this, do we have a range in square footages? Is there a median? What's the optimum kind of deal? Well, there, there none of that came out. It just gave us numbers to work off of. Mm -hmm. If you're designing, and here's the if you're designing a new TCAT, right? What's what do you use? for the basis of that. Yeah, those questions maybe should be directed at Woody or, or uh, Dick. Well, I can yeah. yeah, Woody. Again, the, yeah. The, the, the space guidelines are probably not the best basis for individual building design. And they are kind of, as you suggested, Dick, they are to look at, at what we've got now and is there a shortfall or a surplus and in what area? Uh, th this is Patty. I would propose that we uh, set up a time to go through the the guide for the T cats and go ahead and go through all of that and look in the different categories and see if the categories are not there or the space is not adequate and see if there are modifications that we need to look at that look at and perhaps get Woody on the phone and see if we can bridge this uh, bridge this just a bit uh, so that we can consider what we have in place now and whether or not there are any changes that need to be made. So I'll get that set up, Dick, and so that we can uh, dig into this in more detail. Any other questions? Patty, I have one. Um, <clears throat> I've always, I've always had a little trouble with the, uh, with the classroom piece of this, where it was one of the first tables you presented art, where you show, uh, got, it's got a red, uh, might be that red one. Yes. And when, when I, when I see this table, my mind goes to uh, code requirements for buildings. Mm -hmm. And when we're having plans reviewed for classrooms, unless, of course, if a classroom is fixed seating, then they, they, they look at that. Fire code looks at that. Building code is an assembly space. And your occupant load is your number of fixed seats, according to uh, you know, whatever your design winds up being based upon code requirements for fixed seating. But when you have uh, just a classroom with tablet iron chairs or tables and chairs, our uh, factor per person is 20 square feet per person. So when we're having to design a building around that and we've got a, a fixed occupant load, or a, or, or a cap on an occupant load for the space, how does that relate to the load number in this chart? Mm -hmm. Well, it's obviously it, it doesn't. Um, so what, what you're saying is, is that no matter what, uh, it's 20 square feet per student by code? 
Does it vary by, by the number of seats? It, uh, it's my understanding is 20 square feet per person on a classroom. In a university setting, they're using the uh, uh, classroom multiplier, and I believe that I believe that uh, per person allowances uh, may be the same for K through 12 as well. I'm not don't hold me to that, but it could be. But uh, yes, it's 20 square foot per person because see on, on our campus, Art, and I know you're familiar with our campus. You know a lot of our older buildings when we've gone through and and uh, we've upgraded the building, done some renovations, and and in some cases we've reoriented the classroom. Uh, and uh, I know in some of our older ones that were built in the 20s and 30s, uh, we lost as much as a third or a half of the occupants in those rooms uh, based on the new code. Uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, we may have had a, um, a room that they were cramming 60 or 70 people into, and actually that room should have only had 42 or 44, um, you know, because of the square footage and because of the number of exits also play in, into that. But, um, you know, I can go back and, and, and look at some of our life safety plans and our code review plans, but uh, to my knowledge, all classrooms are rated at, at uh, 20 square foot per person, unless it's fixed seating. Tony, have you run into that issue? In terms of um, occupancy of classrooms, we do have, we have about 12 classrooms on campus that don't have enough doors. So we have to limit the occupancy to them or they would be over uh, 50 occupants. But that's just based on the total occupancy and whether or not you need the second exit. That's right. So have you run into a code issue where code would limit the number of students in a classroom? Anybody run into the to the issue that Jim's or uh, uh, that yeah that Jim has raised? Carl, let me add to your question to Tony. Really, I guess you could say we have we have two issues. We have. We have rooms, uh, well, first, our occupant load is calculated on 20 square foot per person. And, uh, you know, we have several rooms where we have more than one exit, and that's not a problem. You know, if, if it calculates out 70 or 80 students for that room, then that's what we put in there because we're compliant with exits. And then the second issue is, is the way you present your question, is the way Tony responded, is that we do, we do have some rooms that square footage wise, when you divide that by 20, uh, we may be able to get 60 people in a room, but because there's only one exit, we have to keep that, that occupant load at 49. And we have gone to several of those rooms on campus and evaluated whether or not we can put in a second exit. And if we can meet the diagonal rule, according to the code, we do add a second exit and make those rooms compliant. But we still have a few that we're unable to do that. Jolene, have you run into that issue? I, I really haven't had conversations with the uh, architects about applying these standards, to be honest with you. So Jim, uh, basically, are, are you saying that 
um, the, the bottom line number should should be 20 square feet per student, independent of of the size of the number of, of, of the seats in the room. Uh, yes, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Uh, Jim, this can is you? Patty. I, I think I, I think we can take a look at that. But I guess the way I, that I'm thinking about this is that this this chart uh, is is not a, of course not a guide for codes, and the only issue is is the door width and the the hallway width and the exit width, um, uh, stairwells and so on, in terms of overall building capacity, which uh, the, the, the room occupancy would affect. But I don't know that we would want to use that as a guide here for the occupants, for the uh, number of occupants that you're planning for in the way of the type of classrooms that you have. The worst thing that would happen is that you uh, would run into situations where you need to add a door in a new building or cut a door for an existing uh, space if you can. I, I have a question in regards to the uh, square foot per student. Uh, does the square foot per student take into account the teacher space and then also uh, ADA seating uh, needed in, in classrooms? It should. So, but just, can, point, just, or, just uh, point, if, if you're looking at the red chart again, under tables and chairs, the high end number works with what Jim was saying up until 150 uh, to, and, and above. So we would need to use if, if that's the, if that's the case, we would need to use that set of numbers instead of the ones that are uh, in the red box. But that set up basically that then all rooms would be the equivalent of tables and chairs. Jim, can you send us a particular code site that you think uh, is causing you that issue? Uh, sure, we can we can look up the code. I'm not, I'm just going by. I know I've read it in the code in the past, but my, right now my mind's going to uh, all the. Uh, life safety plans that we submit to the fire marshal and what comes back on their stamp drawings. But uh, we can get the code citation as well. If the fire marshal is going to make some comments, he's usually going to reference it to a code uh, site paragraph. Correct. Correct. So if you can help us out with what, what you think is causing your concern, that'd be interesting. Yeah, for, for, from my perspective, uh, what I see uh, here is two different things. You know, that what, what we're looking at right now on the screen is what uh, works for us when it comes to the using the, the, the usability of the space, what is comfortable, what is uh, what is needed in the uh, teaching environment. And the building code uh, typically is just for life safety issues. And I think that any architect that is working on on, on higher ed and especially specifically here in Tennessee, uh, would understand that uh, their work may have to require them to do a little bit of both. Um, you know, designing to the using the space and double checking with the codes. Because obviously the square foot uh, that we're using here is uh, higher than the codes are required. So it will require the rooms to be larger. Uh, so I do think that we will have to have second means of egress uh, more often than not. Uh, even though the occupancy is less than 50 students. Uh, but the size of the room will be big enough that it could host more than 50 students if you apply the building code square footages. Any other questions? Comments? I'll, while everybody's thinking, I'll go back to uh, the question about the space formula spreadsheets 
for the capital budget submittal this year. And uh, in thinking about that, the uh, figures that will be filled in for the enrollment will be the fall 2019 numbers. So in one sense, this year for the 21-22 submittal, uh, those numbers, enrollment numbers, will be based on fall 2019. Therefore, it, it's uh, pretty much fixed for this particular year. We would not be in any position where we would be modifying any of these guideline numbers for this year's capital budget submittal. Next year may be the real anomaly year in the sense that it's reflecting what's happening now with the fall uh, 2020 numbers. So that may be a discussion point. Uh, we certainly will want to look at the real enrollment numbers. Uh, again, I, I don't know where we might be in the way of adjustment for the THEC formula uh, for any kind of interactive type of learning environments. But, uh, but we can talk about that as we go through the formula and take a look at these areas that we might want to be fine tuning. So for the purpose of this year's capital budget, using those fall 2019 enrollment numbers will be fine. Question? Mm -hmm on maybe a related subject, what's, uh, what are the campuses thinking about uh, with uh, the impact of the virus may be on your campus and on the uh, classroom, class lab situation? Tony, I'm sure you guys have talked about it. What I understand is social distancing in all classrooms and um, which means that uh, they're going to have to they're going to have to be uh, more or less like half the students or a third of the students there one day a third another a third another or half on one Tuesdays and Thursdays so they're matching up the uh, uh, head counts uh, with the square footage of the rooms we've taken a look at rooms and seeing what they the capacity would be with the social distancing so and lauren uh, kane i think is on the call if she she may have more to add she's really been working on that perfect classrooms that is and we were looking at like duke university came out that they were going to use 50 percent I'm not finding anywhere hardly where we have 50% capacity left after six foot social distancing. Uh, for instance, a six seating auditorium that has 88 seats because of the aisleways and how big the front area is for the student, for the professor. I mean, we come down from 88 seats to 17. So in a 24 foot or 24 seat classroom, we have sometimes four seats in a tablet um, desk situation. So it's it's had quite the impact on this. So I think they're going to schedule, for instance, like an English 101 class, maybe instead of teaching it four times a day, they'll teach it eight times a day after that. I don't know how that's going to work out. Um, we're still in the cleaning process. And with our general purpose, because we actually went in and it all depended on not this formula that we all kept trying to get to, to see, but the actual architectural layout of the room, what type of furniture is in there, if it was a standard type furniture, or if it was six seating, or if it was an auditorium setup, it all played a role in it. So we, we spent countless days, weeks, and hours trying to figure out a formula to get to a percentage, and we just never could. So I just had to push on and get what I said. So we're still trying to work with moving our general purpose layout into dedicated spaces, and I think we're gonna work more hands-on with professors that need help actually laying out those spaces next step. So you're going to be having smaller section sizes because of uh, room capacities. Does that mean that, that, that the faculty will be, be teaching more sections and will that have an impact on faculty load and what's, what's allowable in terms of contracts and so on? That's kind of what we're hearing. Um, but we don't have that in concrete yet. 
uh, I think that that's going to have some pushback, obviously, from faculty too. So we'll just have to see. He's working with the provost office to see how he wants to do it. And he's working, of course, with these beans and chairs. Yeah, if, if you just take the raw number of if social distancing is six feet, so six for six is 36 square feet, that's off the chart for any of these categories. Mm -hmm. This is Laura with ETSU. We we have been struggling with the same challenges as how to help our faculty understand their capacity in their classrooms and we did some typicals because certainly you can't do a revised layout for every academic space. This, the magnitude is just too great. Um, but we saw anywhere from, like you were saying, your fixed, your densely populated areas where you have fixed auditorium seating. We saw a 300 seat lecture hall go to a 42 seat capacity. If you do that truest mm -hmm. interpretation of the six foot um, circle, essentially, and and so it was about a 14% capacity yield. And then in most spaces, though, where we have either individual desks or we have tables and chairs, we're seeing a 50 to 52% capacity yield in those spaces. And then labs are a little bit more generously spaced anyway. So you're looking at a little bit higher yield on those. But it's hard to answer all the questions. That's something actually I've been on multiple calls yesterday and today trying to help our faculty because they certainly are asking a lot of facilities to help guide them and, and it just there's so many various layouts it's hard to hit just one magic number i mean there is such a range in our spaces so any tips on that i'm eager to hear this is patty and in the scup call this week they talked about uh, a triangular or a hexagonal type of shape of spacing, which you probably have already arrived at that conclusion. Uh, but they talked a lot about that instead of using a square kind of shape for the orientation and location of those seats, uh, that if you use a triangular or hexagonal shape, uh, that is more efficient, they'll gain maybe another 10%. It's not as much as you would think, but uh, a little bit more. Jolene, have you been on any of the issues discussions at uh, UT? I have not, uh, Carl. They those are happening happening at the campus level, and uh, we haven't been invited to those. I mean, we get updates from the chancellor's office. You know what they're looking at, and that it sounds like they're looking at you know the same sorts of things that that you all are describing here. Um, you know, I've sat back and wondered how that's going to impact this, the space standard situation if we're just going to skip over a year <laughs> in using the data and hope that, you know, another year out, we're back to something more normal. Um, I mean, it's kind of difficult to think we've got already built space that we're going to have to be measured this way by. You know, I'm just imagining uh, the long range impact maybe more in the area of, of uh, the, the, the classroom hybrid types of courses and, and more opportunities for online and in that sense uh, could affect the need for classrooms. And uh, so that, that's going to be interesting what that effect is going to be over time with the, with the change in, in how people are using. Mm -hmm. I think it might encourage more of that when when more faculty find out that, that it can work. Mm -hmm. And they get accustomed to it. Mm -hmm. So that would have a bit of the opposite effect with having creating more available classroom space, oddly. I think the hardest um, disciplines that it will be hit would be science and engineering with the laboratories and having that mm -hmm. soft hands on um, activity is going to be really tough at, at the uh, social distancing. You, know, you can do some of that online, but, but at some point you just need to be in the laboratory. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? 
I'd like to invite everyone to send questions, uh, suggestions, comments. Uh, we are going to be heading into our process of moving the PFIS to THEC, and that will be a, I'll call it a longer range project. Uh, the focus uh, will be on the move itself and also in uh, developments for changes that we may want to make in the survey portion. We certainly want to take the opportunity at the same time to be making improvement to the uh, PFI in the classroom, uh, there's a PFI portion, and a look at, at the formula if there's any kind of cleanup or, or I'll call it fine tuning that we want to do uh, with the formula. So also uh, we'll follow up Dick with you and uh, on the, the TCAP portion and, uh, and community colleges and uh, we'll follow up for a more detailed conversation with you. So anybody send me questions or, or suggestions uh, if you have them, please. And this is a good time to be uh, digging into this. I really appreciate your time this morning and most particularly thank you to Art for your time and great presentation. This is great information and Carl as well uh, for piping in, knowing so much about the history of this. So we really appreciate it. Thank you everyone. See you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Patty, I'll send you the updated version. Okay. That sounds good. Let's see what I do. Is everybody hanging up? We'll hang on here for a minute. Yep. So what's the virus doing in uh, Boston, Art? Actually, it, it is certainly diminishing uh, and we're slowly opening up. Um, restaurants are still, the only seating is outdoors or takeout. Um, we've, we've had fewer and fewer cases being registered so far. But, you know, with, with the um, protests and so on, there's, there's going to be an uptick, I think. Um, a lot of a lot of the kids here, a lot of the people at, that were out on the streets were wearing masks. But who knows? So I think we'll probably see a jump again. But it's not going to be. I don't think it's going to be as um, as bad as as it seems to be in some of the other states where they've opened up way too soon. I think our, our governor has been pretty careful about things. My son is in Japan, and he said. Even before this, you know, probably 50% of the people were wearing masks. And since the, you know, since it started, you know, 95, 98% of the people are wearing masks. And now Tokyo with uh, their 34 million people have fewer, fewer cases than the city of Nashville does. Yep. Yep. I think some of those Asian countries have been preparing for this for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And we just pretty much ignored it. So I, th I think uh, it's a good lesson for us. Well, I think we've got a lot of people that just disregard it. It's <clears throat> not important for them either here. I see people out all the time that just blatantly disregard any precaution. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, sign of evolution. <laughs> Not just <this> election. Yeah. <laughs> That's one way to look at it. <laughs> Here first, folks. Oh, it's, man. It's the, the Darwin rule, huh? Right. The Darwin theory rules. <laughs> well, I see Bill Waits is still on the phone. Bill, it's fine if you want to hang on here. Um, we're going to, I guess, just one to, to follow up. We've got our. Uh, 8 30 uh 8 30 8 o'clock we talked about joining monday morning so bright and early monday morning uh to walk through the uh comparison space comparisons for the ones that we have coming up yep. um, i suppose excluding ut uh not uh and i'll, I'll get with tony hobson and see what they want to do i'm not going to cancel those until i hear from him that they want to cancel 
and, and delay, and which we certainly can do. And that, that would give us a little time to go through their data and use some time to go through their data when we get it. And if you can find out a little more about Jubilee's loss, that would be, because that, that's a big deal, I think. A big deal, yeah. And uh, so um, I'll uh, ask Tony about that. And uh, then the follow up, I thought we might follow up with Dick and see if he we would want to pick one of those times that we had scheduled for UT to talk with Dick and maybe Woody if he wants to. Clearly, they're having a level of frustration with. Uh, and, and I'm sitting here. I can share. And of course, you know this. I'm, I've got this screen pulled up with the guidelines uh, for the the uh, discipline areas for the the TCATs and. Uh, you know, I don't know if we don't have the right categories or spaces or it just doesn't apply. I'd like to hear more about what their concerns are about this. Because the TCAT does look at both uh, the lab and classroom and, uh, right. and, and a lot of them have them in the same area, but the numbers still ought to work. I mean, even They're if it's pretty just, generous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe we don't have all the disciplines in there that they need. I don't know. You know, and, and Woody did look at, uh, I think we have 32 separate independent campuses, all of those, only 27, we have satellite campuses. Didn't look at any of the lease space, but we looked at all the own space. And uh, so Woody did the master plan for, for the TCATs? Yes, yes. Statewide master plan. And then that's that's where this the TCAT formula came out of. Yeah. We ran that by you, I think, Art, and you you kind of said that that was more detailed than you had, so you right. could. But he did have a range in there, and the range, oh. you know, kind of he ran that uh, that big chart where he looked at every program at every campus and went from low to high on square foot per FTE. You know, and like auto mechanics, uh, you know, it might have gone from, from from 80 to 480. And so you say, well, somewhere in the middle, there's a range that's, that's appropriate. And so what he did is looking at at all of the square footages of all of the, you know, auto mechanics program and talking to the instructors, he kind of, and looking at the lab, what he did was hit a sort of a minimum, you know, below this, it's just too crowded. Above this number, it's not effectively used. They're just sort of wallowing in the space. So that's how the range was established. So was Dick talking about, Woody's numbers or the the numbers in in THX, uh, guy. Well, what the art or Dick's comment starting sounded like he was talking about this the old THX TCAT formula. Right. Bring that, Patty. Can you bring that up? I've got it. Um, let me see if I can Does Art bring have this to... over. Right. I'm going to. See if I can do this. Uh, hold on. Can you see my screen? No. No. Okay. Something was happening. No. <laughs> no. I can't see your Share. screen. Share content. Let me see. it now uh it says start it yep yep so there's how many programs there on the left 20 Seven. oh it starts at five yeah it goes so. to five it goes to 29 yeah 24 25 and they're you know there are some separate, uh, you know, like Paris had a program and like 
small engine repair. Well, you just kind of pick up the, uh, the closest one or do one down below, you know, 28 or 29 line. But there was, uh, there's classroom space and lab space and classroom space is 24. I'm not sure how he arrived at 24, but uh, typically the, uh, the classroom space at a TCAT is, is almost like a class lab. It, it, it typically includes uh, computers because they're not, they're not on manuals anymore. The hard copy manuals, almost everything is online. And then there's a, a range uh, for the lab. And that range is not really big, you know, 400 to 480. I mean, and so it did give a minimum and maximum. And again, this was, this analysis primarily came about in, as some way to evaluate all the spaces that we had. So what Woody had determined is that if you've got at least 400 square feet for auto body, you know, you're probably okay. And so, you know, if you have 800, they're not necessarily going to take it away.